Welcome to the Underscore Transformation podcast. My name's Jason West. My name's Joe Ailes. And together we're the founders of Underscore. This is the seventh episode in our bonus mini series on the future of work. Last week, our special guests were Mari Milsom, resourcing transformation consultant at Capita, Simon Brown, freelance HR transformation consultant, and Underscore's Joe Ailes, playing the role of knowledgeable panelist in what has to be the standout performance of the year. So, <laughs> Joe, how did you find the role of informed panelist? It must have been a stretch after talking to me for so many weeks. Oh, gosh, yes. It was uh, certainly different. It was actually, it was really good fun to be on the other side of the fence. Um, yeah. Primarily because we've we've done transformation projects for a long, long time. So actually, we've got a lot of experience and um, and knowledge in this space that I'm quite happily, quite happy to share with our, with our fellow listeners. So um, yeah. that, it was and interesting. It's- it's interesting that uh, there's been a real consistency in a lot of uh, the conversations that we've mm. had between uh, the three different panels. Um, the you know there's definitely this need to focus on things like data, um, mm. and Simon mentioned that again, didn't he? Around yeah. um, particularly um, not data analysis, it was data integration that he actually yeah. called out as being a really specific skill set, and he's really right to do that. Because, yeah. yeah, you don't need a, unless you're huge, unless you're tens, hundreds, well, hundreds yeah. of thousands of employees, it's unlikely you're going to need to do a huge amount of data yeah. integration on a regular basis. Yes, yeah. and, uh, and the fact the reality is that a lot of these um, systems now, they're enterprise-wide systems, right? So they will connect with a whole load of other um, um, systems across the organization long gone are the days where, um, you know, functions will implement um, a a solution that's standalone for their own function. So yes, it, it, you know, these cloud technologies will naturally start to integrate into the broader sort of enterprise ecosystem, as as, as many call it. So yeah, it's uh, it's natural that there's a, a high demand for those skills. Yes, um, yeah. And I, I, actually, staying on a point that that Simon made, I really liked his his view mm-hmm. that you need a blended team to implement these technology solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, it can't just be consultants or it can't just be contractors or just permanent staff or I suppose it could be but the the best outcome is to actually have a blended team when you're implementing because mm. there's strengths and and weaknesses of people coming from those different parts of the organization or the different parts of the market and yeah. the best outcome is to actually use a blended team yeah and he made a point actually that um for for many this were this this will be new they wouldn't have done this type of work before so it's important that you know leverage on on the experience and knowledge that people that have been there done it and know where the trap doors are and engage with them so that you don't make the same mistakes um yeah and just anticipate some of those <laughs> recurring issues that happen with every that happens with every single um, program that could be anticipated and prevented if you've got the right partners and the right sort of um, advisors with the right skills and the right knowledge around the table so, yes, um, so yeah. yeah, that was a that was a, a key point there, um, and very well made by Simon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think Mari made a really interesting point around opening up mm. project opportunities for internal staff yeah. to to bid on, and because uh, it's going to help their development of their skills and their capabilities and their, their you know their their careers. In fact. Yeah. And, and, and that's not something that necessarily happens that way. No, no, it no, tends to be just, someone gets a tap on the shoulder. Yeah, it's, we don't often see it, do we? But um, but actually, some there is a scarcity of skill set in the market around some of these things. So actually, if you've got capability internally, even if it's in in other corners of the organization, if you're able to tap into it and mm. and, and bring that capability, that skill set onto your project, you know, why why not? Absolutely, I think that's. It is brilliant, but it's um, the idea is is a great one. But actually, it's not something that we often see. Maybe maybe we will start to see a lot more of that as data and insights around people's skills and capabilities become more widely available. So a lot yes, of that yeah. is probably a lot of organisations probably don't do that because they don't have that information at their fingertips. So as talent solutions get deployed, as skills and competencies and capabilities get sort of deployed across the organisation, becomes more of a BAU. I can pro- I can see that in the future, 
projects and organizations, businesses will leverage all of that data and all that insight to do exactly that, to say, well, actually, yeah. you've got capability that to do what, you know, program management, data migration, integration, ZTL, whatever it might be. We've got capability. We know we've got capability because it's in our skills database. Let's tap into it. Let's see who yes. else yeah. who, who might be able to do it. So, um, yeah, no, it would be, yeah. be a great world to be in if organizations are leveraging that um, that data and that insight from the software that they would have they, they, they've procured. Yes, yeah, and it's often a uh, it gets cited a lot, doesn't it? That mm. uh, LinkedIn knows more about the, yes. the skills and knowledge of your staff than you do, because yeah. <laughs> there's there's a real incentive and there's a you know a really decent UI and a, a good user experience of. Uh, and a reason for people to keep their skills and and experience updated on LinkedIn more so than in your internal systems. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, they I mean, know more about your people than you do. Yeah. So if if actually having having projects like that internally that um, encourages and almost incentivizes individuals to you know record their their skill set in 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 the database because they might be tapped up to do something really interesting in in the business they might feel uh, they 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 might feel encouraged to do or, or they ought to so or, yeah, so yeah that and that was to, to the point that both Mari and Simon were mm. making around the, the impact of not having this technology mm. and not having this uh, these these kind of the design skills and the user experience skills within an HR function is that people aren't going to get those experiences internally mm. and that's going to affect your retention. And if you don't have a digitally savvy HR function, then you're going to suffer when you're trying to attract mm. people in with the right skills that you need to be successful as an organization. I think it really talks to that point. Mm. Mm. So, and I think finally that Mari made a really interesting point um, in that a lot of our discussion up to uh, the, the round table last week had been around skills and capabilities but actually it's it's just as much about mindset uh, when it comes to mm. this digital transformation uh, and being able to respond to rapidly changing markets as it is about a anything else about skills you know the, you have to have the right mindset and she was making the point around you know there's a difference between people who can see the forest and those that can only see trees yes indeed so um so we'll pick up where we left off uh, so over to you jason to continue the debate so if you've identified that you've got this enduring need for um, design thinking, for data and analysis, for project and change type capabilities. Um, how readily available are HR people from the market that have these skills if you're hiring permanently? I, mean, I think one thing to consider is experience because I think when someone has gone through a whole transformation experience once, they're quite well equipped to help an organization to know what to look out for, where we can accelerate, where we can focus, where we can simplify, what are the traps, what are the things to, to avoid. So, so I think one of the benefits is if, if you've, to, to use that phrase, if you've seen the movie play out, um, you know what's going to happen and you know what's going to happen. You're quite well equipped then to uh, to help others who have never made that journey before. So that's one aspect and it's based on just pure experience of, of having done this in a practical way and um, being seasoned and, and having uh, the, the pain um, and the gain as well. I think another aspect uh, has been alluded to is just that pure willingness to um, want to embrace uh, change and, and perhaps want to uh, bring some of the things that we've experienced as consumers or customers with other digital transactions that we do in life um, into the workplace. So if you have that willingness and then you also can combine it with somebody who knows what good looks like uh, and is very ambitious to recreate good um, in this environment, that that can help enable the organization to make the journey and, and want to make the journey. I think also there has to be incentives. You know, what's in it for me is often a question that people ask and that there has to be um, a benefit for them, you know, to want to make that journey and a benefit 
for, for several of them to to want to take the fruits uh, of having made that that journey so a lot of it's about ex, you know being clear up front uh, what is the strategy what is the vision what is the mission uh, what is the roadmap uh, and how we're going to make this journey together and in such a way that people want to make that journey and is there a particular kind of skill set that's got a, the, uh, a real mismatch between the demand that people have and the supply from the market uh, when it comes to these kind of transformation skills or digital business skills? I think one area that is quite difficult to uh, find is um, data integration, because obviously when you're looking at process and system and people and data, there are four factors there which need to uh, align and um, the, the the data piece is very, is really important because without a good data flow and without good data information and the ability to be able to report you, you don't have the trust to say well these these management reports are accurate we can rely upon them we can make business decisions on them so so often i've seen a challenge where having those data integration skills internally is not easy and then going to a large consultancy to find those skills um, is not easy it tends to be quite a specialist area and it and it probably is not something that you're doing inside a company every week every month every year it's something that you're doing as you start to uh, implement uh, and make uh, configurations in a in a in a system, um, yeah. so so buying that in, you know, it's rather like the kicker in American football. They're not on the pitch all the time, but sometimes you need to bring them in so that uh, you can score uh, when you need to score. Yes, yeah, and, and Bar- Mari, you touched on that kind of mindset piece before. Um, is, is there are there any other areas that have this kind of real mismatch between what what's needed and what the market can supply on a permanent basis? Uh, gosh, I think uh, an area that I'm seeing more and more is uh, around things like strategic workforce planning. It's uh, something we've talked around in HR for a, a long time, and as businesses develop their strategy, actually working out what the skills are that we're going to need and how to get to them is something that. Uh, most HR generalists will really struggle with and that is something that is periodically going to be need to be done and the HR will need to buy in some expert uh, resource to do that a mm. part of that is the strategic thinking as well so we've talked about HR you know and as people who understand what good looks like right now but you also need people who can describe what good will look like in the future and how things are going to change that have got yeah. that, their, their, their ear out, they understand what's happening in the wider marketplace. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with that, actually. I mean, if I look back um, at uh, HR over the years, it's something that they've struggled with throughout. And that stems to their ability to engage the business on strategic conversations. You know, what, what's, what are the capabilities that the organization needs in a mm-hmm. short term, medium, a short, medium, and long term, and and having the 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 ability to construct that that people plan, that capability plan that the organisation needs, for, and and what I, you mentioned it earlier, Marie, that HR functions are far too reactive mm-hmm. um, to business requests and business demand, and they're not they're not very often on the front foot in terms of okay, let's really drive the strat- the strategic workforce ag- uh, yep. uh, agenda for the organization um and actually at a practical level they don't know how to i've gone into i've i've, um, I've, I've helped a number of, of organizations and i've gone and and just just ask you know what tools and practices do you use to to determine what the uh, the workforce planning require workforce requirements are for the future and and you know it's on spreadsheets powerpoint slides and and nothing sort of too systematic really and and there there lies the there lies the issue and um and the other the other skills that the other skill around business partnering and again we've been toying with this idea for years and we about about getting hr functions and hr business partners to to engage um more strategically with their um uh, their customer groups or the business lines their business lines or business units they support and again if i if i look at 
on a practical level, they're not having those strategic conversations. They're having real operational ones. The, the business partners are often the yes people that uh, do the, the transaction, transactional work the business leaders want them to. So yes. um, I think HR functions really have to step up, um, step, step up their game. And they're in absolute, they're, they're in a perfect storm right now, aren't they? Because HR is front and center of everything that's happening. So I think, you know, the entire business has turned their attention to, to the HR function to guide them through this COVID madness with all these rules around furloughed, not furloughed, and what can we do with the workforce during these difficult times? So HR have got to use this as a, as a platform to really elevate themselves. So they've got to equip themselves with all of these skills. So strategic workforce planning for me is key. Business partnering is another one. And I think you, you mentioned, Simon, data, insights, um, having that ability within your HR function because you, you're, you're going to have to tap into people data yes. uh, more and more on a daily basis in real time. Yeah. I think they've got to stop and not revert back to managing uh, people processes for the business. You're absolutely right. They spend way yeah. too t- much time with the trade unions, managing pay processes, managing performance processes, managing redundancies, as opposed to actually driving the strategic agenda. Mm. Yes, it's very much still operationally focused, isn't it? And um, mm. that transition really to be transformative and to be forward thinking and to leverage data and business information um, and be a true business partner as opposed to uh, a supporter is the mind shift. And as you say, Joe, I think in a sense, there's a, an opportunity now, isn't there, perversely through COVID because we have to do things differently and HR has often had the opportunity to step into that place, not to default, um, you know, once we start to uh, reach our new normal, to take the opportunity to, to to continue to build from there. And sometimes it's about just a, sometimes it's about a mindset, you know, and sometimes it's about growing assertiveness skills. And sometimes it's about uh, thinking more, commercially and more strategically as opposed to thinking about policies and procedures. Yeah, so it can be a real challenge though, can't it? When you're, you've identified you need these new skills and this new mindset, but you've got to attract them into your organization and that, that might be quite traditional today. You're right at the start of this, this journey of becoming more forward-looking, more technology-enabled. You are listening to the Underscore Transformation Podcast. If you'd like a few more tools in your crisis management kit bag, why not visit underscore-group.com forward slash CMR toolkit to hone your crisis management skills, lead your organization through recovery. How, how do you best go about attracting people in that have got, got these, these kind of skills and mindsets? And um, Simon, you touched on it a bit before, but we could if you could expand that a little bit. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, and there's another aspect to this, because what I said before is that um, identify people that already have had that positive experience. Mm. So in another organization, uh, they've had the opportunity to grow those skills, they've had the training to develop those skills. They've worked as an internal consultant, perhaps, to an organization. They've come from a, a commercial background. These are the kind of skill sets that uh, are, with experience, helpful in this situation. But, but also, one thing not to underestimate is that um, some of these skills are transferable across functions. And so we don't necessarily have to think we're in HR, therefore, the only way forward is to uh, look at HR as our talent pool. You know, mm-hmm. There's an opportunity to look outside of uh, the talent pool to, to, to obtain these transferable skills. I've seen quite a few organizations looking at um, leveraging marketing skills, for example, into, into this environment or uh, business analyst skills into, into this environment because yes. they're the kind of skills that uh, are now needed rather than perhaps those traditional skills. And then lastly, I think one thing not to forget, and we tend to underestimate this, is that we probably have a lot more talent in our organization than we uh, are able to um, signify or we're able to identify through traditional methodology because we tend to think in terms of succession plan, organization charts, and hierarchy. 
people bring life skills, uh, you know, from outside of work into the, into the work context. And I've just seen quite recently how mentoring has, you know, tremendous benefits where people can connect with each other, they can network with each other, they can transfer knowledge with each other outside of those traditional um, organization charts and indeed outside of the organization, cross-company um, mentoring um, to, to connect people. You know, it's something that taps into knowledge that people have that isn't traditionally recognized within their job descriptions. Yes, yeah. Those informal networks across organizations, they sort of really need to be encouraged as well, isn't it? So yes. you know, build connections, build relationships with, with, with people. Um, and again, in COVID, we've done quite a lot of that, haven't we? Um, obviously, Underscore uh, is a great example where through running events and podcasts and webinars, it's just an opportunity to exchange information across organizations, which perhaps in a previous world wasn't happening so frequently. Um, mm -hmm. but, now it, but now it can. And I think um, people working virtually as well, I think, opens opens a mindset to uh, how you can do work um, and how you can exchange knowledge versus, you know, I must be in the office face to face with somebody in order to have that dialogue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Mari, I'm interested in your perspective, perhaps thinking back to some of your previous kind of operational resourcing leadership roles, when, when you're having to attract in these quite different people, but also you have it you, you need to select the right people and how, how do you go about doing that when you don't actually have the skills and capabilities in house so how do you attract these people and then how do you select um, it's the right a really ones? interesting challenge and um you are looking for a, uh, a skill um, and a type of behavior that you may not necessarily have in the organization. If you use your traditional methodology where one of your considerations is organizational fit, then you are immediately restricting the pool. And also what I have seen traditionally is where we demand a certain level of experience, either sector or even down to in, in HR, demanding that somebody has HR experience, which probably may or may not be necessary for the role. But again, you are selecting out huge swathes of uh, people. What I'm looking at at the moment is starting to work with Capita on is actually what we're calling cultural ad. So rather than somebody needing to you know, fit in with our culture. Actually, we're looking for people who are going to add something to our culture. And I think you can apply that to mm. uh, a lot of areas where you can say, actually, this is a skills ad, this is a culture ad. But also recognizing, yeah. uh, to Simon's point on mentoring, that you are going to have to put extra support in place for those people because they are going to go into an organization that doesn't currently work or behave like them. And that's a really tough ask um, if you're trying to make a change. Yeah, because if people are going to fit into your current culture, then exactly. how are they going to change that culture but, if they're in it's, yeah. it's a traditional bias <laughs> that yeah. uh, straight away, in which case we need people who look and act like like we currently do, but they are not going to be able to make the changes mm. that we need. So you need to attract people mm. actually, but give them the support and be really upfront right at the start how you're going to support them and some of the challenges they're going to face. But that's the only way to do it is to, to throw the rule book out in terms of, of what we've traditionally done from a resourcing perspective. And have that in inclusive approach. I mean, I'm seeing some uh, recruiter roles now, which is specifically looking at inclusion yeah. and diversity. So, so it's actually broadening it from, you know, we need somebody who fits with uh, X, Y, Z into recognizing that innovation comes through, through diversity and having different ways of thinking and different backgrounds uh, into the equation. So it's almost like a conscious effort, isn't it, to to say let's let's break the mold and let's widen this in order to uh, create an environment where people can come and uh, be creative and, and make a contribution which isn't the same as the contribution that was made last year or the year before. Absolutely. And we have to go into their yeah. space to find them and assess them in their space in a way that makes sense to them not necessarily in a way that makes sense to us so some of our traditional assessment methodology that are that expects 
somebody come to our organization understanding our organization and behaving in a way that we think they should at a assessment center or interview we need to throw out because again we are putting guardrails in around our current culture and, and what we currently find acceptable um, that may or, that, that are probably stopping great talent from coming to our organizations but also stopping challenging and the mm-hmm. change from happening so it sounds like you really do have to rethink the whole how not just who you're you're looking for but how you you select the right people absolutely yeah you can't continue to use the same selection methodologies if you or because you'll only get the same outcomes and i think as resources we've always held ourselves up as mm. uh protecting diversity trying to make sure we get the absolutely best person but as I've really been digging down into this, actually, we have got so much bias in our resourcing processes that describes best in um, Mm -hmm. what can be a very white middle-class business way that, that again, stops Mm -hmm. a huge wealth of knowledge coming into organizations. I mean, I mean, from a resourcing perspective, what's in, again, that's really interesting because, um, you know, we're the gatekeepers in a way of, of that process but then we're also relying heavily on on hearts and minds of people across the organization from changing too because um you know ultimately that hiring manager that's making that decision also needs to have been brought on a journey of you know do you do you realize that asking these questions will create bias you know do you realize that you're looking for people from this university and the people that go to that university tend to come from this type of background so it it, it takes you know it's a cultural change across an organization and it, it takes time and a lot a lot of resilience for, from resourcing functions and hr functions to drive that change in behavior and change of mindset across the organization and uh, and 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 being firm really holding firm with the, those um, those individuals those hiring managers that will be difficult to persuade to think differently about who they need to hire and uh uh and, and the, the background is, of those individuals. Well, if HR is going to, as it's got the, the, the COVID ball right now and it's going to continue to run and lead from the front, it's got to get comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. um, and not just solving problems for the business, but actually sometimes making yeah. them. In order to make change, you've got to make really problems agree. as well. Yeah. Do you think yeah. HR functions are really ready to, to and resilient to today or do you think it's something that they, they're going to have to develop over the next um, you know, six, 12, 18 months. Unfortunately, I don't think no. they're, they're ready. I think they're minority yeah. are. I think there are some, some great leaders out there, but this is where we are going to need organizations like CIPD to start to step up and, um, but also CEOs, big business to start to, uh, really keep HR at that top table and driving the organization. Yeah, because certainly, I mean, there's a recent survey of CEOs to ask them to identify what they saw as the top 10 issues which needed to be addressed um, to enable their organization to, to thrive. And, and not surprisingly, seven out of those top 10 were people-related topics. So I think for chief uh, executive officers and chief people officers to recognize if they're the enablers, you know, if these seven uh, aspects uh, of a business are the enablers, what can we do to build that capability so that we can uh, really grow uh, in these areas and address these issues? And how can we build the the assertiveness, you know, to, to sustain this? I think, I think they're going to be interesting questions for CEOs and uh, chief people officers to answer. And of course, you know, Given the context we're in now, change is a, an essential. You know, change um, is really um, a condition of uh, continuing to play the game. Uh, and it's the, and it's, the, it's the classic phrase, isn't it? Um, it's our ability to adopt and to evolve that will decide whether uh, this business or that organization is, is successful. So it, it's not a, a nice to have. Um, the people stuff, you know, it's not a nice to have. It's a, it's a key criteria 
um, to enable success. And we're going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. But before we do, um, it'd be really good to get your views on, you know, from a, if you were a, a chief people officer or you were advising a chief people officer that was looking to get the best possible return out of their technology to build a, an agile and flexible workforce, what would be your advice to them on, on achieving those aims? So perhaps if I tend to you, Simon. Yeah, in terms of technology, I think I think firstly not to see technology alone, but to see mm. it as part of uh, the DNA. You know, along with data and along with process and along with with people uh, and managing that change journey. Cloud solutions clearly are flexible, um, and the ability for people to be able to do their own transactions and to have automation and to to do self service and do reporting is clearly part of that. So any organisation. That, that can make that commitment, uh, I'd certainly recommend them, recommend them to look at a, an end-to-end -end cloud solution to uh, underpin that because it's true that when these systems are implemented, they can probably contribute at least 50% to driving the change because of the ways roles and responsibilities are constructed in that system. Yeah. So, um, so certainly I, I would see that as being, a, if you like, a, an enabler and a backbone, but not, not the pure uh, single solution. Yes, it's definitely not the be-all and end-all, is it? Just putting the technology in. And um, Amari, your perspective on that? I think the, uh, the the CHRO needs to have a look around their table and go, who in my organisation is driving the transformation agenda? Who is looking at the, the future of this organisation and what we need to do and how we harness that technology, as opposed to who is you know, potentially getting caught up with turning the handle in the day job. Yeah. And it may not necessarily be the CHRO or the CPO, because actually a great leader needs to put those skills in and have them around them mm. and uh, maybe pass the strategy to somebody else who's got the time and capacity to do it. Yeah. And, and Joe, what, what would your advice be? In addition to what Mari and um, Simon mentioned, I would suggest that CPOs need to make sure they have the right infrastructure in place to sustain the change and deliver on those business case commitments post go live. Um, additionally, they need to make sure the function has the capability to engage the business in a fundamentally different way. So business need leaders will now have access to data and, in, and insights they wouldn't have had access to in the past. And I have no doubt that it will be the ones asking challenging questions of the CPO's function. And it, it's been a great discussion today. And as ever, we are literally just scratching the surface of this topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But some, some really practical advice there for, for our listeners and hopefully that they can apply in their organization. So look, thank you all for your insights and for sharing your experience today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So that's it for the Future of Work mini-series. We hope you've enjoyed it. We've certainly had some great guests and it's given us an awful lot to think about. Uh, in fact, it's actually inspired us to start designing a new leadership development program that's going to give people the skill set, tool set and mindset they need to thrive in a digital post-COVID world. So we're going to take a break for a few weeks. We'll be back in October to continue our regular transformation podcast that's going to focus on transition and go live. This will be our third season. To learn more about the initial phases of transformation, take a listen to our back catalogue for practical advice on the critical success factors when scoping, designing, building and testing a transformative business change. If you found this episode useful, remember to subscribe, leave a review and share it with your colleagues and your network.